Yes, we are on. This is Jack Napier, Red Pill Reads, together with Carl from Black Label Logic. And we are talking about Building Value, his latest book. Carl, thank you very much for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you for doing the recording of um, Gendernomics for the uh, audiobook. My pleasure, my pleasure. It really was. It helped me out with a lot of things, not just sexual market value and things like that, but also economic principles that I never knew of, actually. So it taught me more than economics in school ever did. Well, that was kind of what I had in mind for it, because I figured by using that analogy, I would automatically be teaching guys about uh, economics. And I think having a sound uh, understanding of economics is important to enable you to live the life you want. True. Not a, not a bad point. But what specifically um, about the sexual marketplace and economics made you want to write about all of this? I mean, Gendernomics 1 is a pretty thick read. You put a lot of effort into it, but where's the where's the why in it? Why I wanted to write it? or uh... yeah. yeah, because you're the only one who delved so deep into the material about sexual marketplace. Well, I just thought when I heard that analogy of the sexual marketplace for the first time, I just started looking around and I kept seeing, you know, okay, this is a confirmation of this economic principle because economics at the core is just about how you utilize and distribute resources. And then you can go as deep, deep as you want with it. But once you're um, in that view of things, then it becomes obvious that people are just resources. And when you're trying to get laid or you're trying to find a partner, what you're doing is you're going out into a market and you're looking for a specific solution for your problem. Mm -hmm. And what you value there is going to be dependent on what you're looking for. So it makes um, perfect sense to use economics. Like there's a supply and demand, for instance, which is kind of a central principle in genderonomics. And um, the issue there being the supply and demand differential between men and women, because in theory, we have about 50-50 uh, gender distribution. It's 51-49 in favor of women, mm -hmm. uh, according to the CIA fact book. But everyone is always trying to get a better deal than, like everyone dates aspirationally. So you have a bunch of people at the bottom there that are kind of being left behind. And you have people at the top that are in very high demand. And that kind of shapes the way the market works because the people at the top, they have a lot of um, opportunities to make choices and make better choices, whereas the ones at the bottom don't really have any uh, opportunity to be discerning. They just kind of have to take what they can get. Mm -hmm. That's why you can see good looking guys dating, well, for lack of a better term, fat chicks and things like that and the other way around. Well, you'll occasionally see something like that, and a lot of the time, you know, you'll see a guy date a girl who's maybe a little less good looking than he is. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of those, it's become because of value added. Because once you have to deal with a girl on a long term basis, there are other um, choice criteria that influence your selection than just her looks. If you're just trying to have a one night stand or something, then it becomes. Um, you're just looking for someone who kind of hits those triggers for you. But if you're going to be with someone for five, maybe 10 years, then you're going to have to look into other criteria. Like, can I stand to be around this person? That's a big one. Like I once had the, uh, I don't know, I'm not really speaking for everybody else, but just, I think that most guys prefer a blonde with big tits and a nice ass. I think, but I once had one fake tits, like, by God, biggest fucking tits I've ever held. But after the second lay, when she opened her mouth, I just couldn't stand her. I was finding reasons to kick her out. And that really made me realize that no matter how good she looks, if you can't stand her, you, she's worthless. She's absolutely worthless. She may have a 10 in looks, but her personality brings everything down to a five. And... I had a discussion with a friend of mine who said, Jack, the only thing you want is a virgin who fucks like a whore. But my counter argument was, I don't want the virgin who's a whore. I just want a girl who's enthusiastic 
that makes the 10. Not necessarily her looks. I mean, her looks have to be a seven or above for me to find her attractive. But if her character, her way you're speaking just annoys me, it's done. She's down five points. Well, I think that can be a major factor, and that's kind of where you have to draw the line because you have girls who are one night stands, you have plates, you have uh, LTR girls or whatever, and you kind of have to figure out what category is a given girl in because you have a lot of good girls that are uh, are great. Um, what's it called? Um, great one night stands, but you don't want to be around them for too long. And then you have girls who are maybe mediocre as one night stands, but are great in like a longer term context. So it's just depends on what you're looking for. You Like they have the old expression, you can't turn a hoe into a housewife. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a similar thing. If a girl is only into her looks and only into her body, if that's her only selling point and there's nothing else you like about her, you're going to have an issue uh, being around her in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever tried that on Tinder? These girls that put foodie or I love food in their description and you just ask them, but can you cook? how they just go mental. Yeah, I never did that, but I imagine that wouldn't go very well because a lot of the times with um, with girls, it's like, it's very basic. And every girl is like, I'm, I'm unique. So I love pizza, wine and traveling. And so does every other girl on Tinder. <laughs> True. But she's special because she's inked and pierced. Mm. Well, I, don't, I can I, deal with a little bit of tattoos and a little bit of, um, piercings but there's a limit to how much what would be too much for you uh, it depends kind of on the girl but uh i tend to say that you know a tattoo on the tits is like putting a bumper sticker on a lambo true but what about in between the tits not a big fan of tattooing that area in general <laughs> it spoils the view well i think it's just the same thing with anyone it's with tattoos and piercings, like I recommend that guys who kind of have that extremely nerdy look, getting a couple of tattoos that will help with, uh, you know, bad boying you a bit up. Mm -hmm. But uh, don't go too far with it because you don't want to get like a full Japanese, uh, full body tattoo or something like that because you still have to uh, consider that you need to work. Like a face tat is a great way of saying, uh, you know, I'm a bad boy, but it's also a great way of saying I never want to work a proper job ever again. No, that's capitalism's fault. Capitalism made these people not have a job. Nothing to do with the tattoo. Yeah, we're all uh, big haters of capitalism here. Yeah, me too. No, I was just kidding. You see, like Aaron Clary made that point a lot. Like these guys with tattoos all over. I can't find a job. It's capitalism's fault. Fucking morons. Well, it, it's like the whole thing with, uh, you know, you can actually drive your value down in the sexual marketplace quite easily. And in any other marketplace, like finding a job is about having a set of skills that someone is willing to pay you money to use. And it's the same thing with um, finding a partner. It's about having those traits that someone finds attractive mm -hmm. and, and you traits that other people value rather than traits... Uh, that you just have by default true and you just mentioned the very fair point that it all depends on what you want and that's what i liked about gendernomics one a lot is that you described very well that the sexual marketplace in general isn't really a thing but that the sexual marketplace is divided in very multiple marketplaces so your sexual marketplace is very subjective to the things you want. That really was an eye opener to me because I kind of held on to the thing that the 10 is a 10 in general. But as you just mentioned, it's, every, it's actually very subjective. It depends on what I want. I mean, you may like blondes, I may like brunettes, vice versa. Big tits, small tits, big hips, small hips, things like that. So that really was something i think most guys can have a great message to that they don't need to have the instagram model to have a 10. their 10 will be a four to anybody else it's what they want i think that's maybe a bit a little bit too hard on it i think to some extent it's subjective in that 
uh, if you ask 10,000 guys to rate a woman, mm -hmm. you, the little large numbers will kick in and she'll hit kind of a median rating where, you know, some guys will say she's a seven, some will say six, some might say five, but you're not going to have like, no, she's obviously a 10 or a one because mm -hmm. you're not going to have that big of a disparity because there, there are biological factors at play that make us like certain things like waist to hip ratios, clear skin, long hair, et cetera, signs of fertility and vitality. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are smaller mar niche marketplaces within the sexual marketplace. It's very easy to think of it as a monolith, but it's much more like a stock market. You have a ton of different companies being traded on the stock market and their value goes up and down depending on, uh, a lot of different fundamental factors, but there are also trends and um, that type of thing in place. So, you know, a girl, if a girl is a nine in one place, she'll probably be a seven, eight or a nine anywhere else. But uh, if you take one of these, um, take Orlando or Miami or New York or Hollywood, those are places where extremely hot girls congregate. So a 10 in Hollywood is probably gonna break the uh, chart in bumfuck Idaho, <laughs> whereas a girl who's a six in Hollywood can be the hottest girl uh, ever if she's in Boise. True, true. So especially, it depends. Uh, let me try to phrase this point. So it truly depends on where what is. Again, the 10 in Hollywood will be a 10 everywhere, but how many Hollywood tents will be in Dumbfuck, Idaho? Not much. Yeah. No, I think that's the biggest factor with it is just that uh, when we talk, when I talk about subjective value versus objective value, mm -hmm. what you're dealing with is um, an objective value is okay. How much did it cost you to produce that sprocket? Mm -hmm. That's the the materials that went into it, the labor that went into it, and everything. What's the price of this thing objectively? But when you look into subjective value, you're looking at how much is someone willing to pay for that? Because someone, if you're selling anything, uh, you have to value the money more than the item you're selling, and they have to value the item they want to buy more than the money. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you cannot trade, because if everyone agrees on the price of something, then you'll never have, because in that case, your product is going to be worth exactly as much to you as to the guy who wants to buy it, and where is your incentive to sell in that case? Mm -hmm. So that's where I think subjective value comes in and why that's really important because uh, if we had an objective sexual marketplace, then everyone, we could just pair people off um, by looks ratio exactly. We would have everyone's sexual market value. So you just go with your uh, sexual market value uh, diploma and you present it to a girl of identical sexual market value and be like, hey, let's hook up. We're the same. No, it's demand and supply. Yeah, exactly. So you're going to have some people who are in more demand than others. You're going to have some that are in uh, under supply. Mm -hmm. And you just have to uh, kind of try and balance out those factors. And one of the reasons why you get these. Um, let's call them clumpings, is that uh, Chris Rock's old statement that 20% of the guys do 80% of the fucking is pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Because nature likes to experiment on men and it uses women to determine which experiments are successful. So you see a lot of more genetic variance in men than you do in women. You, you see this on IQ, you see it on mental illness, you see it on everything else. Mm -hmm. But women, they always want to, you know, want the top guys. So uh, a bad experiment won't be able to procreate. And then that nature knows, okay, this was pointless. I'll try something else in next generation. Hmm. Isn't that why most of us have, uh, what was it again? Three times the amount of female ancestors instead of male. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that one. Well, is that the reason why most of us have three times the amount of female ancestors than male ancestors? Don't know if you're familiar with that fact. No, I'm not familiar with that statistic, but it, I remember something I read from India where 
uh, the number of girls versus the number of boys that were born to couples depended on what caste they were in. Because um, um, if you have, uh, if you're really high value, you can have a lot more offspring as a man. Mm -hmm. But if you're really low value, you have a better chance of reproducing as a woman. For instance, if you look at royal families and really powerful aristocratic families, uh, they usually had more boys than girls, whereas the low classes had more uh, girls than boys. Because they could wed out the daughters. Because at the uh, top level, you get more offspring as a guy, because a guy can, in theory, impregnate a thousand women a year. A woman can only do one pregnancy a year. True. So if you're a real winner in the sexual marketplace, you can really maximize your number of offspring by being male. Whereas if you're uh, in the lower ranks, you will still probably be able to have some offspring as a woman, even though you're not really the uh, uh, bell of the ball, so to speak. <laughs> you didn't so, win the lottery genetic wise. No, so women are in kind of the, um, how do I put this? They are the safe bet uh in the sexual marketplace whereas men is it's more of a risky thing like if you're a guy who's really successful you can do much better than any woman in terms of reproduction but if you're a guy who fails out you end up doing much worse than your average woman so um, it's all on us to kind of build ourselves up into uh the type of guy who can be successful no and um, before we get into that the people who are live stick around for anyone who's watching this on rewind you can watch the full version of this conversation on patreon forward slash jack napier 368 if you enjoyed this please check that out to watch the full version of this thank you for everything like comment and subscribe and i'll see you on patreon